Hey everyone, it's T. So if you've been on Tumblr anywhere between like now and probably 2012, especially if you like film screen caps or aesthetic colorful things, you've probably seen a screen cap like this or this or maybe this. They're all super eye-catching and it's a style that I don't personally see a lot in films, even like 10 years later. So today I wanted to talk about the 2012 movie Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter is a live action horror based on the 1995 manga of the same name. It stars Erika Sawajiri and is directed by Mika Ninagawa. I wanted to go over the film's style as a whole because I think that it's just so unique, especially for the genre. So the plot follows the model Liliko, whose beauty is so famous or infamous and unmatched that she is the most popular model in all of Japan. What most people don't know about her is that she has had full body plastic surgery in order to achieve her otherworldly looks. In order to maintain them, she has to keep getting surgeries or else her body will start to essentially rot. And the movie follows her as she begins to degrade physically and mentally. So Wikipedia defines this movie as a psychological horror, which is pretty on par. I think it's not scary, but I was like sitting through a lot of the scenes like, like a lot of the movie is horrifying. I'll be giving light spoilers throughout as well because the movie is over 10 years old and also like, it's just not something I would recommend <laughs> watching. Like personally, I really like the movie and find it valuable, but it is like two hours of just triggering content. So <laughs> like everything there is for a reason. So it's not necessarily superfluous or for the purpose of like mocking or titillating, I suppose. But if you do decide to watch just, you know, take some care. I won't go too deeply into more difficult topics for your sake and mine. So let's get into it. Liliko is the main character. She is extremely beautiful, but also just evil. She mistreats her assistant. She is demanding and spoiled and vain. She uses her beauty to coerce people into doing just absolutely heinous things. Inevitably, perhaps by karma or just time, her beauty starts to deteriorate rapidly in a very obvious way. At the same time, she's being replaced by a newer, younger model played by Kiko Mizuhara, who is naturally beautiful. This paired with the side effects from the surgery incites her downward spiral, which is only exacerbated when she meets this detective prosecutor. He is investigating the clinic she visits and knows how she looked before all the surgery and wants her to testify against them. In general, the theme is pursuing beauty according to society standards is killing us, literally, metaphorically. Bring it away from the movie for a moment, I used to follow a lot of celebrities. I still follow some K-pop idols and it makes me think of how these very visible people will get work done over and over and can basically never stop, both because of changing societal expectations and also because if they ever do, their faces will sag or become damaged in ways that they wouldn't have otherwise if they had just let themselves age. This movie kind of reminds me of that. Also, the director is quoted as saying that the purpose of her art is to illustrate the world of women and specifically for Helter Skelter, that beauty teaches us that the world is not equal. The movie definitely <laughs> tries to focus on that aspect. Women who can no longer afford to keep getting treatments end up losing their minds, destroying themselves. I'm also not sure if this was intentional, but Liliko's current modeling career is shown as akin to a kind of sex work. She is considered an investment by her manager, who she calls mother. She participates in the casting couch, and her work is largely dependent on how people consume her. I'm not exactly sure if it's supposed to be a negative comparison so much as a neutral one. I think it could be argued either way, but I do think there is a purposeful irony in that later on in the story when we find out that before the surgeries Liliko was a gravure model slash adult actress. The public is immediately disgusted 
even though she was essentially doing almost the exact same work in her mainstream career. One thing that I really like about the film is that Erika Sawajiri is, if you follow Japanese celeb culture, you know that before this movie was made, Sawajiri was basically blacklisted from the industry for being rude. She gives some terse answers to the press on a press tour. It's generally not the kind of etiquette that's expected of a Japanese actress. So her company dropped her and Helter Skelter was considered her comeback role. She won an award for it. She has since been blacklisted again in 2020 and is maybe in jail? If you're curious, Wikipedia is there. Regardless, there is a lot of emphasis on Liliko's interaction with the press, her playing the PR game, that I think is really clever based on who they cast, especially because the director wanted Sawajiri like from the jump. I'd say it's also a little bit of commentary on Japanese stardom as a whole. So let's talk about the style of the movie. It's super saturated, very lush, very rich, especially when it comes to Liliko. I'll get more into the set design later. As far as the general design goes, each character has their own color scheme. Liliko is usually red, a very intense color. Lust, passion, power, all of those things encompass her character. Liliko very often uses sex as power over others and tries to destroy them with it. Whenever she's expressing vanity, she's usually in red lingerie, looking at herself in a mirror. Her rival is mostly associated with light blue and her youth and indifference about her own natural beauty kind of fits with the light pastel colors that we see her in. The prosecutor's office is mostly a dark gray, kind of the same as you would see in a noir film or like, I don't know, Law and Order. <laughs> Every set is super stylized and considering the movie is based on a manga, it really plays up the hyper-reality and almost fantasy of it. Certain things like why is there a huge print of Liliko's lips on her window? Why is the prosecutor having a very poetic monologue here? What's going on with these fish? It's all a little less off-putting because of the style of the film. And the look itself is very characteristic of the director, Mika Ninagawa. She started out as a photographer in the 90s, helping popularize a style called girly photo. If you see any of her photography, it's basically one-to-one -one with the movie. A lot of fish, water, cherry blossoms, bright light, super saturated color. So a bit more in depth with the costumes. When Liliko isn't dressed for a photo shoot or a gig, she's usually in lingerie of some kind, either red or white. We can go with the very obvious symbolism of white as innocence, and the irony being that Liliko is far from innocent. I think it's not much of a stretch to go with that interpretation, especially because Throughout the movie, she's wearing red, but when she must apologize at her final press conference, she's wearing white, contrasting the red theater surrounding her. And her costumes are always big and eye-catching. Huge wigs, dramatic gowns. She's almost like this Lady Gaga kind of character, larger than life. I think it works really well in making her feel like an icon without having to give so much background. And also showing that most, if not all of her fans are women and girls. These are looks that would definitely more pander to the female gaze, if you will. <laughs> the movie establishes within the first few minutes that girls in particular love her. They want to be like her. They want to look like her. I love the sequences showing the Gyaru type of girls discussing her. In the late 2000s, Gyaru style and corresponding magazines were where a lot of the popular styling and beauty trends for teens were shown. And it was also considered a little bit rebellious as well. A lot of Liliko's styling choices coincide with these trends as well. As far as the set design, what I really like about the film is the frame is almost never empty. There's always stuff. If the set isn't something super detailed already, they'll add in things to make it seem interesting. Random furs and pearls. I really like her assistant's house. It's very warm and inviting. I also hate, I hate this man. I hate the boyfriend. If you watched 
you know why. Also, I like that the fabric, the textures feel really lived in. They were bought a long time ago. They're, they're well-loved pieces. The mother character has an apartment that kind of mirrors Lilico's, which is ironic when we find out that Lilico's face is modeled after how her mother used to look as a young woman. She has the rich red fabrics, a portrait of herself. I also like the detail that she just takes a million beauty supplements. There's also a ton of orchids in the room, which Google says means a lot of things, but one of them is beauty. Lilico's room is very Baroque inspired. A lot of red and gold and black. It's really hard to focus on any one thing. There's lots of animal print and beads hanging off of lights to make them sparkle. Of course, there's several mirrors and Lilico generally seeks out a mirror or reflective surface in almost every location. There's a lot of religious imagery, crosses, statues, portraits. It's almost entirely Christian, but I do think I spotted a Buddha statue. Liliko herself is never actually shown as religious. She is in fact very sinful. It's interesting to see the shrines juxtaposed with the shrines that she keeps of herself. Once her body and mind are starting to degrade, they show the pictures in the bathroom, religious figures with their eyes taped over. The Virgin Mary is a particular focus, and I'm wondering if there's a significance there as Liliko is often, you know, seen in white. If so, I think it's more indicative of how Liliko sees herself than how she behaves. I also know that, like, even though most of Japan is not Christian, they do use that imagery a lot. I think I've read articles about this. So the inclusion of that set design might be purely aesthetic. There's also a shot of Liliko lying on the bathroom floor with jars of water around her. And I feel like this is a reference to something religious, but I can't say for sure. But the angel-devil dichotomy isn't really a stretch. Liliko is this godlike, mythical figure to these girls that provide the commentary that bookends the film. She's someone to be feared and admired and worshipped. Her apartment also changes with the state of her mind and mood at the time. More clutter, more things are torn apart. Outside of the apartment, Liliko's decline is juxtaposed with the super bright, pastel, vibrant colors of the photo shoots and sets that she's working on. I feel like these kinds of colors are something that I don't often see in horror, which is very fun. I love the combination of something like garishly bright with an otherwise dark subject matter. I also forgot to mention probably the most prevalent motif in the entire film, it's even in the poster, and that is butterflies. Butterflies are used in Liliko's costumes, in her apartment as set design. They are seen during her climactic decline towards the end and generally are used as symbols for her beauty and also for her transformation. In the very beginning of the film, she is unwrapped from her medical gauze, almost like a butterfly coming out of its cocoon. And lastly, I wanted to go over one of the last shots in the film. So this is basically Liliko's old apartment fit into a tiny space in a way that feels like a Baroque painting. There's so much drama. <laughs> it has all of the elements that I mentioned before, but it also has this huge paper flower, the feather boa, she's wearing a crown. Paired with these fetish heels and the lace bodysuit, it gives very queen of the underworld. Essentially, Liliko has sold her soul for beauty. So yeah, that's it. Also, fun fact, I first discovered this movie because I was very into AKB48 as a teen, as a young teen, and I watched the heavy rotation music video. I'm not going to show it. It's a lot. Don't watch it at work. It's... <laughs> but I watched it and I was a little upset. I was like, what man did this? What man did this to my girls? And it said, directed by Mika Ninagawa. And I was like, oh, okay. So, and I've been following her basically ever since. She has some other movies that are also in a similar, in a similar style, and I need to catch up on those as well. Yeah, if you like this one, you can like it, subscribe if you want, comment if you feel like it, and I'll catch you next time.